Hello learners, welcome to NIO studio, I am Dr. M. Mahalingam. Today I will be taking up a fresh topic of your history syllabus. Let us discuss the lesson about establishment of the Mughal rule. Are you ready? Here we go. What is this lesson about? In the previous chapter, you studied about the establishment and consolidation of Delhi Sultanate, which is from 1206 and from 1206 to 1526. In this lesson, you will study about the conquest of India by a new ruling dynasty, the Mughals. The Mughals were led by an able military commander and administrator from Central Asia named Jaguruddin Muhammad Babur. His successes were successful in establishing an All India Empire gradually. The map shows the extent of Mughal Empire. What are the objectives of this lesson? Knows the circumstances under which Babur invaded India, describes the reasons for the success of the Mughals against Indian rulers, lists the challenges faced by Humayun after Babur's death, analyzes the circumstances that led to the defeat of Humayun and revival of Afghan power, describes the events leading to recapture of India by Humayun, gives an account of the expansion and consolidation of the Mughal Empire under Akbar describes the territorial expansion up to the reign of Aurangzeb, analyzes the challenges faced by the Mughal Empire in India. What is the advent of the Babur, 1526 to 30? Let us discuss advent of Babur, 1526 to 30. The picture shows Babur. Babur traced his lineage from Taimu, the great conqueror of Central Asia, and to Chinggis Khan, the distinguished conqueror. From mother's side, he was a descendant of Mughals and from father's side, the great commander, Taimur. Because of the lineage of Taimur, the Mughals are also referred as Taimurids. Invitations from Rana Singh and Daulat Khan Lodi might have encouraged Babur's ambitions to come to India. Babur was successful in capturing Bira and Sialkot and Lahore in Punjab. Finally, Ibrahim Lodi and Babur's forces met at Ponipet in 1526. Babur's soldiers were less in number, but the organization of his army was superior. Ibrahim Lodi was defeated in the Battle of Ponipet. The forces of Babur and Rana Sangha met at Convoy, a place near Fatehpur, Sikri. Rana Sangha was defeated in 1527 and once again, the superior military tactics of Babur succeeded. In spite of great valor with which the Rajputs fought in Chanderi, which is 1528, Babur faced little difficulty in overcoming Medini Roy. With his defeat, resistance across Rajputana was completely shattered. The success against the Afghans and Rajputs at Panipat and Kanwa was very significant, but the resistance was still present. However, these victories were a step forward in the direction of the establishment of Mughal Empire. Babur died in 1530. Let us look at Humayun's retreat and Afghan revival from 1530 to 1540. After the death of Babur in 1530, his son Humayun succeeded him. The situation under Humayun was quite desperate. Humayun felt that the Afghans were a bigger threat. The main problems faced by Humayun were the newly conquered territories and administration was not consolidated. Unlike Babur, Humayun did not command the respect and esteem of Mughal nobility. The Sakatai nobles were not favorably inclined towards him and the Indian nobles who had joined Babur's service deserted the Mughals at Humayun's accession. He also confronted the hostility of the Afghans, mainly Serkan in Bihar on the one hand and Bagadur Shah, the ruler of Gujarat, on the other. As per the Taimur tradition, Humayun had to share power with his brothers. The newly established Mughal Empire had two centers of power. Humayun was in control of Delhi, Agra and Central India, while his brother Kamran had Afghanistan and Punjab under him. The picture shows Humayun, the fortune. He had two important battles known as Battle of Ch Chaza 1539, the other one was Battle of Kanoj in 1540. These two battles were very decisive, victory for Humayun. His 
His victory in these two battles led to the coming back of Humayun to Indian Empire. The second Afghan Empire, which is from 1540 to 1555, Sersha. The picture shows Sersha Suri. After a gap of 14 years, Sersha succeeded in establishing the Afghan rule again in India in 1540. Sersha and his successors ruled for 15 years. This period is known as the period of Second Afghan Empire. The founder of this Afghan rule, Sher Khan, was a great tactician and able military commander. After defeating Humayun, he became sovereign ruler in the year 1540 and assumed the title of Sersha. Farid, who later came to be called Sherkan, and subsequently Sersha was a son of Jahidar under the kingdom of Janpur. His father, Hazan Khan Shur, held the Jahir of Sasaram in Bihar during the rule of Lodis. Sersha helped his father in the administration of his Jahir. Later, he developed differences with his father and left him. He served under Afghan nobles. After the death of his father in 1524, he was given his father's Jahir by Ibrahim Lodi. He very effectively managed the Jahir of his father. He also acquired great military and administrative skills. His capabilities made him the leader of Afghans. He gradually increased his influence and defeated Sultan Mahmuds of Bengal. He emerged as the most powerful military commander in the eastern provinces. Sher Shah continued consolidating his position in Bihar. He finally succeeded in establishing himself as the most powerful Afghan chief in eastern India. He defeated and conquered Malwa in 1542, which was followed by Chanderi. In Rajasthan, he led campaigns against Marwar, Radhambur, Nahor, Ajmer, Mahta, Jodhpur, and Bikner. He defeated rebellious Afghans in Bengal. By 1545, he had established himself as the supreme ruler from Sindh and Punjab to whole of Rajbudna in the west and Bengal in the east. Sersha introduced very important changes in administration and revenue system. The most important ones were judicial system. He turned towards Bundelkhand. Here, while besieging the port of Kalinjar, he died in 1545 in an accidental blast of gunpowder. Sersa was succeeded by his son Islam Shah. Islam Shah had to face a number of conflicts with his brother Adil Khan and many Afghan nobles. As the Afghan empire was substantially weakened, Humayun was, saw an opportunity and moved towards India. He again captured his lost kingdom by 1555 and entered the second Afghan empire. In 1555, Humayun conquered Agra and Delhi and established himself as the emperor of India. So he came back again. Before he could consolidate his position, he died after falling from the stairs of the library at Sir Mandal in Delhi in 1556. Let's look at the Mughal Empire from Akbar to Aurangasip, which is a very important period of Mughal Empire. Akbar. Akbar was only the 13 years old at the time of Humayun's death. When his father died, Akbar was at Kalanar in Punjab and therefore his Coronation took place in Kalanar itself in 1556. It was his tutor and Humayun's favorite and confident Bairam Khan who served as the regent of the Mughal emperor from 1556 to 1560. He became the Vahil of the kingdom with the title of Khan i Kanan. One of the major achievements of his regency period was the defeat of Hemu and the Afghan forces in the second Pat battle of Ponypet in 1556, who were posing serious threat to the Mughal Empire. The picture shows Akbar the Great. Let's look at regency of Bairam Khan, which is from 1556 to 1560. Bairam Khan remained at the helm of affairs of the Mughal Empire for almost four years which is popularly known as period of Bairam Khan's regency. During this phase, he appointed his favorite nobles on important positions. Bairam Khan emerged as the most powerful noble. He became very arrogant. A group of nobles were opposed to him. They managed to influence Akbar also. By this time, Akbar also wanted to assume full control. He removed Bairam Khan. Bairam Khan revolted and was defeated. Akbar pardoned him and asked him to retire. 
He decided to go to Mecca for pilgrimage. He was killed by an Afghan near Ahmedabad. His son was appointed a noble under Akbar's rule. Akbar started a policy of expansion after overcoming initial problems and consolidating his hold on the throne. Let's look at Rajasthan. It seems that Akbar was fully aware of the importance of Rajput kingdoms and wanted them as allies in his ambition of establishing a large empire. He tried to win over the Rajputs wherever possible in, and inducted them into Mughal service. He also entered into matrimonial alliances with the Rajput rulers like Barmal. Raja Barmal of Ambar was the first to enter into alliance with Akbar. However, Maharana Pratap, the ruler of Mewar, posed most serious challenge to the Mughal emperor and did not submit before Akbar. After a prolonged struggle and siege of the fort of Chitur, Akbar succeeded in defeating the Mewar forces. After the fall of Chitur, Ratambar and Kalinjar were captured. Marwar, Bikaner and Jaisalmer also submitted to Akbar. By 1570, Akbar had captured almost the whole of Rajasthan. The most important achievement of Akbar was that, in spite of the subjugation of the whole of Rajasthan, there was no hostility between the Rajputs and Mughals. Afghans Akbar, Akbar's campaign against Afghans started with Gujarat in 1572. One of the princes, Itimat Khan, had invited Akbar to come and conquer it. Bengal and Bihar, which were under the control of the Afghans, were paid attention after the Gujarat expedition. In 1574, Akbar, along with Munim Khan, Khan I Khan, marched towards Bihar. In a short time, Hajipur Patna and Patna were captured, and Gaur in Bengal was also taken away. With this, the independent rule of Bengal was ended in 1576. By 1592, the Mughal Mansabdar Raja Man Singh also brought the whole of Orissa under the Mughal rule. Next, Punjab and Northwest. In the Punjab, Mirsha Kakim was creating problems for Akbar and he attacked Lagur. Hakim Mirsha immediately retreated and Akbar controlled the whole region. He gave first priority to organize the pr production of Northwest frontiers. After this, he marched towards Kabul and conquered the territory. Akbar gave the charge of Kabul to his sister, Pakhtunisa Begum. Later on, Raja Man Singh was appointed governor of Kabul. It was given to him as Jahir. Next, Deccan. After 1590, Akbar gave shape to a Deccan policy to bring these states under Mughal control. During this period, the Deccan states were facing internal tensions and regular conflicts. The first expedition was dispatched to Akbar Nagar under the command of Prince Murad and Abdul Rahim Khan Khanin. In, in 1595, the Mughal forces invaded Akbar Nagar. Its ruler Chand PB decided to face the Mughals. The territorial expansion under the Akbar gave a definite shape to the Mughal Empire. The map shows India under Babur, Akbar and Aurangzeb. Now let's move into Jahangir and Shah Jahan's rule in India. Jahangir decided to follow Akbar's expansionist policy in the Deccan, but Jahangir could achieve little success in it due to certain problems. He could not devote much attention in the crucial phase due to Kuram's revolt. The Mughal nobles were also involved in a number of intricacies and conflicts to gain some advantages from Deccan. The picture shows Jahangir. During the reign of Jahangir, there was no addition to the Mughal territory in Deccan. In fact, the Deccan rulers weakened the Mughal authority in their states. Over ambition of Malik Ambar was an obstacle in the way of a joint front of the Deccan states. Next, Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan's main concern was to recover the lost territories of the Deccan. He believed that independence of Agamath Nagar was in the way of Mughal control in the Deccan. He decided to isolate Agamath Nagar and win over Bijapur and Marathas. He was successful. Fath Khan, son of Malik Ambar, also made peace with Mughals. Now, Mahabad Khan was appointed governor of Deccan, but the conflict with Deccan states continued. Finally, in 1636, treaties were signed with Bijapur and Golconda. The picture shows Shah Jahan. This picture shows Shah Jahan's court. 
the Mughals could expand their area of dominance to large parts of southern India. A distinct change in Mughal policy came towards 1656-57 when the treaties were signed. Now, Shah Jahan asked Aurangzeb to conquer and annex the territories of Deccan kingdoms. It is argued by some historians that this change of policy was was to exploit resources of the Deccan states for Mughals. However, this change did not benefit the Mughal empire in any substantial way and created more problems for future. The map shows Shah Jahan's era of India. Let's move into Aurangzeb's rule in India. Aurangzeb believed in an aggressive policy towards Deccan. Professor Satish Chandra identifies three distinct phases in his policy towards Deccan states such as the first one from 1658 to 1668 the focus was to get hold of the territories of Kalyani, Bidar and Parenda from Bijapur. The picture shows Aurangzeb. The second is from around 1668 to 1684 there was a shift in the policy. The death of Aril Shah of Bijapur, growing power of Shivaji and increasing influence of Akana and Madanna, two brothers in Golconda administration affected the Mughal policy. The third one, in the third phase, 1684-87, Aurangasi followed the policy of outright annexation of the Deccan states. Aurangasi personally supervised the siege of Bijapur. By 1687, both Bijapur and Golconda along with the territory of Karnataka were annexed in the Mughal Empire. The conflict with Marathas continued from 1687 to 1707. Aurangzeb spent most of his time in Deccan and could manage to keep the region under Mughal control. But after his death in 1707 at Aurangabad in Deccan, they, re they reasserted independence and succeeded in a short period. Apart from Deccan, Aurangzeb could expand Mughal power in Assam in the northeast region. The major success of the Mughals in this region was annexation of Agam Kingdom, which is in Assam under Mir Jumla, the governor of Bengal. Another notable achievement in northeast was capture of Chattaguan in 1664 under Sestakon, the new governor of Bengal. By 1680, Agam succeeded in capturing Kamrup and Mughal control ended. Let us look at challenges to Mughal rule and conflicts and negotiations during the time. Under Aurangzeb, the Mughal Empire reached its greatest territorial limits and it covered almost the whole of present-day India. But its reign was marred by popular revolts of the Jats, Satnamis, Afghans, Sikhs and the Marathas. The Rajputs emerged as an important support base of the Mughals under Akbar and later on under Jahangir and Shah Jahan as well. Rajputs. Mewar was the only region in Rajputana that had not come under the Mughals during Akbar's time. Jahangir followed a persistent policy to capture it. After a series of conflicts, Rana Amar Singh finally agreed to accept Mughal suzerainty. During the reigns of Jahangir and Shah Jahan, the Rajputs generally continued to be friendly with the Mughals and held very high mansabs. Shah Jahan relied upon Rajput soldiers for his campaigns in Deccan and the Northwest. During the reign of Aurangzeb, the Mughal relations with Rajput suffered, particularly over the issue of the successor to the throne of Marwar, Deccan. Ahmad Nagar was first to be defeated by the Mughal Empire. During Aurangzeb's reign, the struggle with Deccan state and Marathas became more intensive. In fact, Aurangzeb spent the last 20 years of his reign in Deccan fighting against them. By 1687, the Deccani kingdoms of Bijapur and Golconda were annexed to the Mughal Empire. However, the time and money spent in the Deccan by Aurangzeb proved a great drain on the Mughal Empire. The Marathas the Marathas emerged in the Deccan as a vital force under Shivaji in the middle of the 17th century and began to challenge the Mughal authority. Shivaji now began to devastate the Mughal territories. Aurangzeb sent Sestakon to control them. The Viceroy of the Deccan with the big army again of Shivaji and the Treaty of Purandar was signed in 1665 between the two. Out of the 35 forts held by Shivaji, he agreed to surrender 23 forts to the Mughals. 
the marathas posed a major challenge to the sovereignty of the mughals under aurangzeb Deccan states put up a stiff resistance against Mughal expansion plans. The northwest frontier region was also trouble spot, and Mughals had to suppress disturbances. Shivaji was asked to pay a visit to the Mughal court at Agra, but when Shivaji went there, he was ill treated and was taken a prisoner. He managed to escape, reaching Raigarh in 1666. From then onwards, he waged a relentless struggle against the Mughals. Shivaji's successor was his son Sambaji. Many Maratha chiefs did not support him. Sambaji and extended help to Raja Ram, the other son of Shivaji. The internal conflict weakened Maratha power. Next, northwest. During the 17th century, the northwest frontier was the main area of activity of the Mughals. Here, the Rosanis were decisively defeated by 1625 and 26, but Gondar became a region of conflict between the Persians and the Mughals. The struggle to capture Gondar continued till Aurangzeb's reign, but Mughals got little success. Shah Jahan's bold campaign to keep the Uzbek tribe under control failed miserably. and the mughals lost huge amount of money and men in the conflict during the reign of aurangzeb the gandhar issue was dropped and diplomatic relations in, in with persia were revived let's look at conclusion it is quite evident that the territorial expansion of mughal empire achieved under akbar continued to be the core of the empire its further expansion during aurangzeb's reign was in deccan and in small measure in northeast region During this period, the Mughal Empire had the largest area. However, the beginning of the decline of the Mughal Empire also could be traced to the rule of Aurangzeb. The breaking up of the association with the potent regional forces like the Rajputs and failing relationship with the Deccan states and Marathas shook the unity and stability of the Mughal Empire. Under his successors, the empire kept disintegrating. Let me sum up. It's quite evident that the territorial expansion of Mughal Empire achieved under Akbar continued to be the core of the empire. Its further expansion during Aurangzeb's reign was in Deccan and in small measure in northeast region. During this period, the Mughal Empire had the largest area. However, the beginning of the decline of the Mughal Empire also could be traced to the rule of Aurangzeb. the breaking up the association with the potent regional powers like the rajputs and failing relationship with the deccan states and maratha shook the unity and stability of the mughal empire under his successors the empire kept disintegrating what are the outcomes of this lesson this lesson has provided an account of the expansion and consolidation of the mughal empire under various rulers it has shown the various challenges faced by them to establish a rule in india let me end this lesson here wish that you had a great learning best wishes thank you